Thank you, Don. All right, good morning, everyone. I'm going to do a quick audio check online. If somebody online can just pop in the chat that you can hear audio, and then we'll get going. All right, we have audio online. All right, good morning, everybody. My name is Budge Courier. I'm going to open up today's State 988 Technical Advisory Board. Today is May 18th. And I want to welcome everybody. And first thing we're going to do is a roll call. And then we've got a couple of new members that we're going to swear in. So I'll do the roll call first. Um, Deputy Secretary Welch. Um, here. All right. Uh, Dr. Goldman. I don't know if he is on. He is. Okay. Dr. Goldman, are you present? If you could come off mute and say here or hi or something, that would be great. All right, we'll circle back. Um, Chief Aiello. Aiello's online. Good morning. All right, thank you. Um, Director Wick. Hi. Hey, good morning. All right, Erica, I see you're in the room. Thank you. Present. All right, Dr. Poon. Okay. Uh, Kristen Miller, I don't believe she's here. We knew she wasn't going to be here. Demetrius Sydney. All right. Jeff Abair. Online here. Thank you. Tracy Gonzalez. Jennifer Kenton. I'm here. Good morning. Good morning, Jennifer. Aaron Riley. Jennifer Dwyer. Here. All right. And Serena Lewis. Here. All right. So I've got, I'm only, oh, I forgot to check one there. So I have eight. So we do have a quorum, which is good news. All right. And we have a couple of uh, new members, uh, one of which is is not on. Um, so before we do that, um, I do want to recognize uh, Dr. Goldman. Uh, he is participating today. He has taken another position in another state. Uh, why you'd want to leave California, we, we won't have that discussion right now, but uh, he's been an uh, really an integral part of the first couple of meetings we've had, has really um, participated in the accessibility work group and has, has been uh, willing to participate there. But um, he's moved on to uh, maybe greener pastures. I guess it's Washington. So technically, at certain times of the year, it's definitely greener. Um, so we really thank you for his participation. We've got somebody that we're working on, um, a replacement for that position. We'll talk about that at the August meeting. And then we have, um, from Calnina, we have a new representative, Amitria Sydney, uh, representing Calnina. She will be, um, the incoming president of Calnina. And so she's replacing Rosa Ramos. I don't believe she could be here today. So she's a new member. And then in the room with us is Serena Lewis, who is joining us with, uh, California professional firefighters. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a swearing in for Serena next on the agenda. So I've got Deputy Director Marv Green is going to do a swearing in ceremony. So uh, Marv, if you want to turn your your microphone on and those participating online, uh, join with us, please. Okay. All right. You ready? Yeah. Hands up and repeat after me. I state your name. I Serena Lewis. Do solemnly swear or affirm. Do solemnly swear or affirm. That I will support and defend the Constitution. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States. To the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And to the Constitution of the State of California. And that I take this obligation freely. And I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And that I will and well faithfully discharge these duties. And I will and well faithfully discharge these duties. Upon which I'm about to enter. About which I'm about to enter. All right. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. All right. And uh, just on behalf of uh, the director of Cal OES, Nancy Ward, I want to thank you for joining the team. 
and thank everybody for the time and effort that they're putting into. Obviously, 98 is very important uh, for the state of California, and happy to have you on the team. Thank you very much. There'll be some paperwork you'll have to sign a little bit later, to make it official. Okay. So don't leave without seeing Butch. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you, Tracy, for joining us. We've got you uh, noted that you're present. All right, so now we have a total of nine. So welcome aboard, Serena. Um, I want to give you an, an opportunity to just to introduce yourself, maybe say a little bit about um, who you're representing and and a little background. Um, so if you make sure you go off mute so we can hear you. So go for it. Make sure it's green. First, thank day. you for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I am with LA County Fire Department. Um, I also represent um, local 1014. I've been with uh, the fire department for almost almost eight years now. I am a 911 dispatcher. I'm also part of the peer support team. So on a daily basis, I obviously take 911 calls. I um, talk to the units in the field, the helicopters, the boats, anything that, you know, brush fires, anything from that to like a cat in the tree. So um, <laughs> we also, I'm also part of the peer support team. So we, Basically, it's training that we do to basically like take care of our own. If any of our firefighters or members or staff or anybody are uh, struggling with mental health or literally anything, divorce, suicide, a really, really bad call, we can get called out and to assist and help and see, you know, what, what, what is needed to help our, our team out. Um, I'm also actively trying to train my dog <laughs> so he can be the first ever, um, a uh, peer support dog in uh, LA County dispatch. So it's going to be a minute, but <laughs> it's going. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you and welcome aboard. Really appreciate it. Um, all right. So I think that covers agenda item number one. Uh, hey, Amitrius. Well, Amitrius, what we will do is we will have to do her swearing in at the next meeting because Marv has exited the building, I think with Elvis, so I don't see him anymore. Um, but we'll uh, we'll catch up with her at the next meeting. So thank you, Demetrius, for joining us. Um, I would like to uh, give you a moment to introduce yourself, Demetrius, as you're new to the group. So um, if you could come off mute and tell us um, who you're representing a little bit about yourself. So go for it. Hi, I'm Demetrius Sidney, and I am representing Nina. I am the second vice president. Um, I come from San Mateo County. I'm the assistant director there for the 911 Center. All right. Well, thank you and welcome aboard. And we'll follow up with your uh, swearing in to make sure that you're official and, and part of the group. So welcome aboard. Thank you. All right. So we will move on to uh, agenda item number two. Um, in February, we had our meeting. It was held here in person as well as online. And um, at this time, I'd like to entertain any um uh, you all should, those that were present, you should have received a copy of those minutes. I want to see if any members either online or in the room have any edits to those minutes. Okay. Hearing none, see any online? Okay. So do we have a motion to approve the February minutes? Faber moves to approve the minutes. All right. We have a motion from Jeff. Do we have a second? Dwyer will second. All right. Dwyer seconds. All right, so I'll have to do a roll call vote just to make sure we do this right. So Deputy Secretary Welch. Yes. All right. Uh, Chief Aiello. Yes. All right. Director Wick. Yes. Erica. Yes. I don't think Dr. Poon has joined us. Um, Kristen's not here. Demetrius. Yes. Jeff, yes. Tracy Gonzalez? Yes. All right. Yes. Thank you. Jennifer Kenton? Jennifer, you still with us? Do you guys see her? She's online. She's muted. All right. All right, so Aaron Riley, I don't think is with us. Uh, Jennifer Dwyer? All right. Yes. And Serena Lewis? 
Yes. All right. So we have enough even without Jennifer's vote. Is that all right to move on? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we will, uh, the motion passes. So we'll move on to um, agenda item number three. So we already gave uh, everybody a chance to introduce themselves. I kind of got, got a little bit ahead of myself on the on the agenda. Imagine that I went off script. Um, hmm, shocking. Uh, <laughs> uh, so welcome aboard. One thing we will do for the new members, uh, we will be sending out the first board meeting we had. We went over uh, Bagley Keen and kind of how a board operates. Meg, our um, legal counsel, gave us a nice overview of that. We'll send you that. It's about a 40-minute presentation just to review that. Um, and really, that's available online for anybody who kind of needs a refresher. I know we only meet once a quarter. So if you ever have any questions about you know, who you can contact and how the board is supposed to operate, um, that, that piece of uh, that first 40 minutes, that first session is really good. So we'll send that out to you. So welcome aboard. And we look forward to your participation. And we've got lots of work for you, which is the good news. All right. So next, um, item number four, um, we have our legislative update. So we should have Reggie Salvador online. Reggie, are you with us? Actually, Budge, this is Chris, and I'm ready for you today. I'm ready wow, to go. the new and improved Reggie. I love it. This is <laughs> great, Chris. Uh, thank you. Discount Reggie. It's more like discount <laughs> Reggie. <laughs> Wonderful. All right, Chris, so take it away, please, sir. All right. Thanks, Budge. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Chris Hacker. I'm in the Office of Legislative and External Affairs at Cal OES. I'm going to run through a list of bills. They're, they're telecom bills, but they relate to this advisory board uh, that we're tracking. Um, I, at this point, I, I'd like to let everybody know Cal OES does not take positions on these bills, but we track them, we look at them, and analyze them for their impact to our programs. Um, so we'll get started uh, in the assembly. AB 44, that's a CLETS bill. This bill requires the Department of Justice to grant access to the system to any tribal law enforcement agency of a federally recognized tribe meeting certain qualifications. Um, that bill is being heard today in the Appropriations Committee on the Suspense File. I say heard, those of you who know how suspense works, it's being voted on today, uh, possibly right now. Um, all right, AB 296, this bill requires Cal OES to do a 911 public education campaign. That bill is also on suspense and being heard right now. AB 415, the Emergency Fairgrounds Communication Act, that bill would provide grants to fairgrounds to update their, uh, upgrade their communications. Um, we've gotten word this bill isn't moving forward this year. Um, we're still watching it though to see if anything changes on that front. It is a bill that's been introduced in the past, um, so likely we'll continue to see this effort, uh, but we've been told it's not moving this year, but we're still watching. All right, AB 5 or 456, uh, Public Post-Secondary Education Campus Mental Health Hotlines. This bill requires each campus of the California State University and California Community College systems without a campus mental health hotline to establish a campus mental health hotline for students to access mental health services remotely that operates during working hours. This bill is also on the suspense in the assembly. All right, AB 988, this is a new AB 988, not the one that passed last year that created your reason for being where you're at right now. Uh, this bill requires an entity seeking monies from the funds to also include the number of individuals who use the service and identified as veterans or active military personnel in its annual expenditure and outcome report. That's the funds that was created by last year's AB 988. Um, AB 1231, Telecommunications Universal Service. This bill requires CPUC to allow Lifeline telephone service subscribers to combine Lifeline, California Lifeline, and affordable connectivity program subsidies on the same service line to provide a more robust voice and broadband plan. plan. All right, AB 1276, Emergency Response, 911 call and dispatch data. I'm sure many of you are watching this bill closely. Uh, this bill requires UC Davis in collaboration with specified state agencies, including Cal OES, to establish a program for the receipt and collection of 911 emergency call and dispatch data to complete a study for the purpose of improving emergency response services systems. The bill also requires UC Davis to adopt uniform statewide data standards for 911 call and dispatch data and to create a data portal that catalogs the collected data aggregated on a statewide level 
and excluding any personally identifiable information. Now, this bill had an amendment lately to clarify um, they're talking, they're, they're requiring it to be the inf personally identifiable information to be de-identified, which requires some active work. Um, so that bill is currently on suspense being heard today, and we're closely tracking that. Moving over to the Senate side, SB 318-211 Information and Referral Network. Uh, this bill requires the Department of Social Services to establish, develop, and administer the 211 Support Services Grant Program. That bill is in suspense in the Senate, um, being heard today. All right, SB 719, Law Enforcement Agencies Radio Communications. We saw a similar bill last year that uh, did not make it. Um, it looks like they're reintroducing this one. Uh, it would require a law enforcement agency, including CHP, municipal police departments, county sheriff's departments, and others, to ensure access in real time to the radio communications of that agency to duly authorized media representatives or organizations. That bill is also on suspense being heard today. All right, so jumping over to the federal side of things, many of you may know federal bills don't necessarily move along the same path and on the same timeline as state bills. So a lot of times you won't see any movement on the bill all year, but it's still there, it still exists and we're still tracking it. Uh, so this bill, HR 369, NIST Wildland Fire Communications and Information Dissemination Act, requires NIST to publish recommendations for specified federal agencies to improve public safety communication coordination standards among wildland first responders and fire management and officials. Um, that bill is in the House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology, so it's still in the first chamber. Uh, that's it for my report out. I'm available for any questions. All right. Thank you, Chris. Any questions from the board for uh, Chris relative to the legislative update? Yes. Go ahead, Erica. Um, for AB 296, did I hear correctly that Cal OES is going to do 911 public education? The bill would require us to do a 911 public education campaign. Now, unfortunately, the bill does not specify the scope or scale of that campaign, uh, nor does it make an appropriation. So those conversations need to happen uh, if that bill is going to move forward. Uh, right now, it's on the suspense file. OK, I just ask in case there was anything um, legislative that was going to support a 988 public information campaign. Yeah, currently the bill also includes 988. Um, I know that there's discussions among stakeholders. Some folks kind of want to keep those separate. Some folks want to combine those efforts. Um, educating the public on both of those items uh, is important. How the vehicle for doing that it is also important. So those conversations are going on as well. I think currently the current text of the bill does include 988. Thank you. Um, AB 296. AB 296 is the bill number on that. Yeah. And if I'm not mistaken, that bill sponsor is Cal Nina. So if you want additional information, Cal Nina would be a good resource. And it was introduced by Freddie Rodriguez. Yes, Rodriguez. Okay, any other questions from the board? You seeing any hands online over there? All right, any questions from the public on the legislative update? All right, and Chris, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you'll send a summary that we will disseminate to the board members, correct? Yeah, I can do that. All right, thank you, sir. Yeah, after today's suspense, after today's suspense hearing, some of these may be dead. So just forewarned. <laughs> right, just for the, those that aren't tracking, um, if it does not make it out of the suspense file and it's a two-year bill, then it's over. If it's uh, if it's in its second year, if it's in its first year, they they could put it in suspense and bring it back next year. It just depends on where these bills are in the process as to what ultimately happens to them. But basically, if you don't make it out of suspense, then if you've ever seen that schoolhouse rock, I'm just a bill, and you don't make it out of committee, and that's it, you're done. That's where they end up, and they just stay there, and they just don't make it. So if you're not familiar with the legislative process. That Schoolhouse Rock video is awesome. I have used it many times to educate colleagues on, on how this legislative process works. Okay. Thank you, Chris. We appreciate right. that. Thank you for the update.
All right, um, moving on to agenda item number five. This is our working group reports. Uh, for the newer members on the board, last time we met, we established three different working groups, a best practices working group, uh, and the focus of that working group was to take a look at what's being done really around the nation, certainly within California, both at the state, county, and local level relative to this new space called 988 and everything that we're uh, working on in terms of behavioral health. Obviously, it's extremely broad. And to bring some of those best practices back and see how they might inform some of the activities that this board is going to do. Um, that the chair of that board is Tracy Gonzalez, and on my team, um, Anita Lopez is, is helping to facilitate those meetings. I do not believe that group has had the chance to meet. Um, Tracy, I know that you're on. I want to give you a chance to provide any updates you might have. Again, we know you haven't had a chance to meet, so I want to turn the floor over to you to see if you have any updates for us. Thanks, Pudge. Um, actually, yes, I do have some updates. Um, my friend put it uh, nicely this morning um, that's on this group that it's definitely been a bumpy start to this committee, unfortunately. And I apologize for that. Um, I had some severe technical issues at the department that I was currently at um, in that the um, people that were sending me emails and that I was sending to apparently was going nowhere um, when they did the upgrade to the email system to the cloud. So technology did not help me in this point. Um, what I will say though, is that uh, the people that I did have um, engage, uh, that I have engaged with, um, I do have some information uh, regarding what is going on um, both locally and um, across the nation. So. Um, so what I did is I pushed it from a county, kind of from a, the 58 counties and kind of worked downward from there, at least to, for the California part of it. Um, and then I will say that within the 58 counties, that at least every county is doing something and is mentioning something about um, 988. Um, and obviously several of them have very large behavioral health programs and initiatives and you name it, um, all kinds of things going on. And other ones, uh, even some of the larger ones, I was surprised to find have uh, not as much going on in their counties. Um, several of the counties actually even said, um, which was a little disheartening to be on the 988 group and see this, but they actually said to not use 988, um, that it uh, was better to use their local line because most of them have already established some type of local line, um, you know, way well prior to 988 to actually becoming, or even the 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 prior line that was the the um, talk line. Um, so, with that being said, the 58 counties, at least everyone, at least has some type of um, ad address uh, is addressing it somehow to say that. Uh, uh, this is how you should contact uh, mental health services. Most of the dispatch centers that I was able to uh, talk to are doing um, some type of mental health evaluation or they have some type of mental health evaluation team within their departments. Um, and what it really boils down to though is that they're they're dependent upon the times and hours and days that that person happens to be available. Uh, so like they have a MET team that rotates through uh, my own area, Area E, for example, um, and they have someone there, but it's, you know, not after seven o'clock at night or on the weekends. Um, some of the counties and agencies actually, even some of their own lines that they're talking about aren't 24 seven lines, um, but like in Calaveras County, it even has that they're um, closed on the holidays for some of these type of um, issues. So it definitely um, is, I guess you would say kind of all over the place, um, but at the lowest level, a lot of agencies are um, and have mental health clinicians or um, pet teams, met teams and different crisis teams that they're, um, have access to, but on a limited basis. On the higher level, obviously, as, as we even know from some of the members on this team that are probably involved in that, um, 
and I refer to like uh, San Mateo um, and San Diego County, those uh, Alameda County, they have very large programs um, as far as being able to have care teams, crisis response teams, community assessment, transport teams, uh, pilot programs where EMTs and clinicians are available seven days a week. Um, so there's definitely a lot of counties that are very much ahead of the game as far as what they're doing. The um, going outside of the state and across uh, the country, there are some definite programs that are being um, shadowed and have been around for you know upwards of 30 years. Um, the CAHOOTS program in Eugene, Oregon is is one of those and that really is is one of the ones that I liked a lot um, because it speaks to what the the dispatchers role in it and how it really truly um, gets down to the bottom level of 911 um, because even though they have these a lot of our agencies within California do have teams um, one they're limited as far as when they're even um, accessible and two, you still have to go through the regular process mostly to get to them. Um, obviously there's like, uh, there's, there's LAPDs, they have the smart units and some of the response teams where, and other um, ways to be able to have triage occurring in the dispatch center. And so the dispatchers are um, able to uh, screen and assess the caller for the most appropriate response, which is really truly, I think the goal that we want in order to have a pathway to 988 and to the best um, outcome and, and response that we want instead of a, a police or fire response. Um, but for the most part, the agencies within California don't, um, haven't gotten to that point yet. Um, the CAHOOTS, again, the CAHOOTS program in Eugene, Oregon, um, the dispatchers are trained, they are able to transfer directly to the program um, who are mental health clinicians. And, and um, several of these programs do report that are doing this um, efficient, uh, effectively for many years. Um, there, Eugene has the CAHOOTS program. Um, Arizona is also one that's looked at for their recovery response centers um, and their model. Uh, Utah is another one. Um, they all report that like around 85% um, of the uh, people that are handled through their program uh, are able to be helped at the phone call over their the phone level um, through just talking on the phone. They don't need a uh, response team a mobile crisis outreach team, 85% um, their concern is resolved uh, just by talking to those um, clinicians and to the, uh, the, the call center. The Arizona model is another one that was uh, designed to address first the first 24 hours of a crisis. Um, and one thing that was, I thought was interesting with that one is also that um, the laws have been changed and that in written in such a way that the it enables the police officers that are still involved when they do get involved in the system that they can take them directly to a crisis facility without medical clearance from a hospital and they have adopted the um, the the no wrong um, entrance to a crisis center. So it doesn't matter if they're, they're having a mental health crisis, but they also happen to be under the influence of, of alcohol and they're a little drunk. And so they won't be turned away um, from uh, being entered into a crisis facility. And that is another um, a way that they've been able to, Arizona specifically has been able to, to streamline, getting, streamline getting people to the help that they specifically need. Um, in reviewing all of the things that the California systems are doing, um, every, everything from the San Diego Imperial County PERT teams to all the way up to Northern California, everyone's got a kind of a mismatch and our, def our system is definitely more of a patchwork system in that uh, still in that there's, there's definitely pieces and a lot of people have a lot of different pieces to the system, but um, as far as the flow to be able to 
have a continuum of care to go from the crisis call center hub to the crisis mobile response and a crisis receiving and stabiliza stabilization services uh, is all kind of choppy in how we, we get there. Um, LA County is, is doing a good job of um, addressing that. And, and agencies where they have places like D.D. Hirsch um, available to them and closer to them are doing an even better job of addressing those services because of just really the proximity. The ones that tend to be maybe farther out or not as um, uh, aware of the, the services and those counties seem to be a little bit less uh, involved with their community and the program itself. Um, so that's kind of my overall, I've got a whole bunch of data and people I've spoken to and, and information from all these specific programs that I think is definitely worth um, looking at. And I do have specifics um, and um, if uh, still needed, I, I plan on, um, I'm starting with my new agency next Monday. Uh, so I will have a new email address and new place to be reached at, which I will share with you. And um, I think I've wrap my arms around the people that um, have wanted to be a part of this group and I haven't been able to reach out to, but that's what I have so far. All right. Thank you, Tracy. I really appreciate that update. Um, I'll, so I'll give uh, opportunity for members of the board to ask any, any questions or maybe specifically any um, specific data that you would want, want to see. So see so you've unmuted. So go ahead, Stephanie. Well, you threw me a little bit because I don't. Ha I'm not. I'm not ready yet to have a something as specific as data as I'd want to see. But I just. I did want to underscore that um, one of the responsibilities of Cal HHS in the policy advisory committee is to do kind of a uh, an assessment of best practices globally in this space. And so, just wanted to um, you know when the time comes, uh, connect more with this group. Um, and think through how we can leverage the work that you're doing and, and include it in, in the plan. We're, we're several months off with that, but just um, also wanted to thank, uh, thank you for all of your hard work in, in, in putting all of that together. I thought it was a really um, pretty robust uh, report out and it's appreciated all of the time and effort you put into that. All right, yeah, thank you, Tracy, for your work on this. We really appreciate it. All right, any other questions or comments from the board? Any board members online? You have one? All right, a public comment. Go ahead online with public comment. Go ahead and unmute. Hello, everybody. This is Matt Taylor. I have uh, recently joined DD Hirsch as the director of the 988 network for DD Hirsch. And I just wanted to make a comment that um, Tracy was noting some counties or other agencies may be a bit hesitant to promote 988 for a variety of reasons, including that they have historically promoted the talk number. Um, if that's in reference to the old National Suicide Prevention Lifeline number, 1 800 273 talk. Uh, just so everybody knows, any calls to that number, to that talk line, auto automatically route into the 988 service here in California as well as nationwide. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that distinction. Thanks, Matt. Uh, but can I can I make a comment? Yeah, go ahead, Tracy. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Matt. I appreciate that. I should have uh, made again made that distinction. Um, but even with that being said, um, I think just um, because of some of the problems that we already know that we're working through, um, they actually addressed them on the on the websites that um, that not to call 988 or that line. They did refer to what I, I had noted, which ones still have the old line, old line on there, and some of them don't have any mention of 988, which again doesn't matter because they can still reach the same place. But because of the area code, many of them were very well. Um, informed of the area code restriction and it's best to call directly if you're here because we will be able to help you if you're in our county. Um, and so, you know, I understand that that concern about um, that technology piece of it that we are addressing. Um, also, if I can respond to Stephanie, um, I do have the, the uh, National Guidelines for Behavioral Health Crisis Care Best Practices uh, Toolkit up um, and I was reading through that and, and working, I don't, is that 
one of the what, the documents that um, you would think would be very, um, I mean, it obviously is literally a best practices toolkit. So I found that, um, would that be something that would be uh, of, of help in our search? Sure, and you guys have heard me present on our crisis care continuum plan. It's actually completed. Um, and we utilize that toolkit as a base uh, for some of the work that we did. So, um, so sure, you can you can send it my way, and um, we can connect offline. Just so I just I wasn't I haven't done a haven't tracked your work with this work group, and so maybe I should be paying closer attention. If I could get connected to Tracy, and that's probably on me. So, no, actually, it's mostly on my side, and um, I plan on in, engaging and sharing uh, this information with um, with yourself to kind of look at some of these because I look at them, but then maybe from my standpoint, it's it's not as um, is useful as it would be um, for what we're trying to accomplish because there's so much information out there. So I wanted to run some of it by you as well, just to be not waste our time either. Um, if some of these are maybe not quite in the space that, for the answers we're trying to reach. So thank you. All right, uh, Dr. Goldman, go ahead. Um, hi everyone. And just first, thank you Budge so much for those generous comments at the top of the meeting. I'm glad to still be able to participate as a member of the public. Um, I just, but your, your question was any data. And so I just wanted to really quickly comment on that. Um, and, and so far as data pertaining specifically to 911-988 diversion, which I think is part of the question that is you know squarely within the focus of this board, um, there is no, uh, research or uh, rigorous evidence base that I'm aware of that has specifically looked at best practices for diverting 911 calls to more of a mental health response or transfer um, to a 988 type crisis line. There has been a little bit of work that's done looking at 988, um, uh, what they call active rescue calls or high risk calls. Um, uh, but again, that's very preliminary and descriptive. And so I comment on that mostly to say this is a gap. And there's, I think, a real opportunity with California's leadership, given how, you know, large a population, how many different systems are involved and likely to be impacted by um, the work of this board that developing that evidence base, including having some expectations for data collection and even you know, contributing to the scientific literature in terms of impacts of these kind of innovative practices is a real opportunity that the field very much is in need of. Yeah, thank you for that comment. And I really would encourage um, any member of the board, if you could frame up a research question that is specific to something you want an evidence-based outcome for, we do have collaboration with lots of academic partners who are you know, doctoral candidates, master's candidates that are looking for thesis work and doctoral work. Um, they take time obviously to develop their outcomes but there, there, there is a, I've, I've been contacted many times, how can we help? And so if you can frame up a specific question, no guarantee that you'll get a, a, you know, an interested party to research it, but, you know, if you can come up with an idea that you'd like some evidence-based, you know, work to be produced on, I think you'd find some willing partners out there across the nation, and we've got a pretty broad reach. Um, across the nation on people that are watching what we're doing. Um, lots of folks are watching California and how we're approaching this problem. So I think it's a really good opportunity for us. Uh, the warm lines comment, um, if I fail to mention it during the technology update, we do recognize that uh, the area code routing is a severe limitation and we are incorporating any existing warm line. So warm line would be that direct dial number to the services that you know are in your county or your jurisdiction. Those will be integrated into the platform, and so they'll be able to, to come into the same environment we're building. We think that's really important, especially until uh, we get a better routing algorithm at the national level that kind of graduates us beyond area code, which is, we've talked about many times, is not necessarily the best way to route these calls. Okay, thank you for the update on that. We'll move on. To, oh, well, all right, Lizanne, go ahead. Oh, no, I lowered my hand, I thought. 
All right. Well, it's good to hear you nonetheless. Thank you. <laughs> <All right. laughs> My question was answered. Thank you, bud. All right. Go, go ahead and just read it out, Don. Yeah, so there is um, the meeting minutes from the February meeting describes what that working group does. I don't know that we've done a document beyond that, but we do have that. And if you're interested in joining the working group, you can send an email to Carrie Johnson. Uh, her contact information is on the bottom of the slides and also on the bottom of the agenda. And we'll link you up to the appropriate working group chair to get you involved in those conversations. All right. Uh, so the next working group, 90 day to 911 interface working group, Jeff Abair is heading this up on uh, my team. Uh, Don Jones has been helping to facilitate some of this. Uh, Jeff, I'll turn it over to you for your update. Blake, you can hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, this information is the update of the, uh, we've had one meeting for the 988-911 interface working group. Um, the working group uh, met online on April 13th. Uh, we had 19 total participants and various representatives from uh, the PSAP community, uh, mental health practitioners and mental health service providers, as well as uh, support staff from Cal OES. So uh, overall, the, the recap of the meeting, uh, we spent time explaining the working group's uh, goals and objectives, um, being able to, to clarify that because I think that this is one of the, uh, it kind of goes along with the, the previous um, conversation before you, or the discussion point that you, you uh, had right before you threw it to me, was the uh, defining each working group's roles and, and making sure that we're actually focusing on what we should be. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, after I provide my report here. Um, so we uh, spent some time just explaining our, what our goals and objectives for the meeting were. Um, we spent some time talking about what the technology looks like today and what the future technology looks like it's going to be um, in, in its impact to us. So uh, the current processes and workflows on how 911 calls are currently routed, how uh, calls to 998 are routed. Um, there was an interesting point that was a, a, a I think in education for most people, the, the realization, especially for those of us that work uh, in a, a 911 center in a PSAP, the fact that uh, 988 calls actually uh, have a rollover process. So they literally could roll over to a 988 center that's even outside of the state of California just to ensure that call is answered in a timely manner. Um, and then uh, some brief discussion on text to 911 and text to 988 and, and how that integration between Vibrant and um, the new call handling system for 988 uh, is is anticipated to um, roll out. And then finally, uh, the last portion of the meeting, we discussed the potential issues and areas for call handling, uh, both between 988 and, and 911. So I'm going to go through my notes here as far as the, the key points that the participants uh, identified as uh, either current problems or potential problems. Um, everybody agreed uh, that it, there would be great benefit for location data to be received from callers to 988, uh, like we see with 911 and receiving automatic location identifier information. Um, we are aware, and this was very aware, uh, made um, well aware to all the participants in the working group that this is a much bigger issue than than just uh, can be solved by either this board or uh, by the state, uh, as it involves the FCC and other regulatory uh, issues. Um, it was already um, brought up, but you had already brought it up, but the, um, everybody recognized that the current routing of 988, the way it's done by area code hinders service and uh, the need for something like a location-based routing needs to be examined. I'm not going to belabor that point. I think it's one of the the, the key issues that this board has discussed at, 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 at least every meeting we've had, even the few that we've had, um, as well as um, in other working groups. Um, the participants felt there could be a need uh, to establish dedicated transfer lines at both PSAPs and 988 centers. Um, that way, the, the, there's a, in a way, like a direct into 
uh, each of the centers as opposed to having to rely on just a public number and potentially hitting a call queue or, or uh, experiencing long wait times. Uh, and one of the issues that was brought up, and there was a, a great discussion about, a, a lengthy discussion, that there is a need for um, both PSAPs and 988 centers to have an easy and quick access uh, methodology, a tool or something like that, that allows, uh, and this is predominantly for the 98 centers, uh, allows them to identify um, appropriate jurisdiction for um, uh, emergency services. So if a 988 center is on the, uh, on the phone with a caller, they have a location, an address, uh, there is a, a, a significant gap for most of the 988 centers to be able to identify, well, which PSAP does this really need to go to? Uh, and then obviously the, the, the expanding problem or the, you know, the expanded problem with that of what if it is only a fire or medical response that's needed that might be a secondary PSAP and not a primary PSAP. Um, so we discussed and I, I had shared um, the, the tool that Nina has, the Enhanced PSAP Registry and Census Tool or the EPRC. Um, I was under the understanding personally that that uh, many 988 centers were aware of that tool that it existed out there, um, and nobody in the, that participated in the working group was aware of it. Um, being able to go into a GIS type tool to be able to plug in an address or a location and identify quickly that uh, well this is the piece app that would handle that area because uh, emergency services response are necessary uh, would be uh, of great benefit. Everybody felt. And um, as part of that discussion, they expanded with the discussion of the maybe there could be um, a, a benefit to have a GIS tool that um, layers on multiple pieces of information related to this. So the areas that are covered by uh, the 988 centers, um, pretty easy for us to be able to focus on because it, right now with it being area code routing, but PSAP jurisdictional handling as well as possibly um, uh, MCRT availability or other, me other mental health response options that are available within that given area. Um, the, the idea of increasing or, or, or allowing access to a tool that allows uh, um, the 988 Center to be able to quickly see what resources they need to be turning to or uh, uh, referring to, transferring to, et cetera, would, uh, would be more efficient overall and provide a quicker and better service. There was uh, also consensus that it would be a benefit to data sharing between 988 centers and 911, whatever that determines to be, um, you know, whatever data is necessary or um, that can either from a rule or regulation or, or legal perspective be shared. Uh, but, you know, the questions of if a 911 call is transferred to a 988 center, um, would it be beneficial for the 988 center to see the alley data? or that, that location data that comes in with a 911 call, or would it even be legal for them to be able to see it? Uh, and then what other data sources might be able to be shared? So not just the, the phone call, the voice phone call, but any data that might come from uh, a public safety answering points, computer aided dispatch system, or on the reverse side, the CRM in use by the 988 center. Um, obviously that would have to be uh, measured by what needs to be shared, what can be shared legally, um, but having the mechanism to share data would, would greatly enhance the, the, um, the interface between 988 and 911. And then um, lastly, the group felt that there clearly is going to be a need for uh, initial training and continuing training for both uh, 988 and 911 staff. Um, obviously that would come after uh, things are set into place and, and protocols and uh, uh, other uh, criteria has already been established. Um, the, the last thing we, we talked about was um, creating a survey. We were very interested in seeing what PSAPs are doing now and what they're experiencing now with receiving uh, mental health calls and their interactions with their local 988 centers or uh, mobile crisis response teams, et cetera. So we're gonna be working up a, a, a survey um, to distribute to PSAPs throughout the state where we can at least start collecting that data to see if there are other problems that we as a working group might want to look at and address. Um, throughout our conversation, there were many topics that kept centering around um, conditions or situations that would require transferring from PSAPs to, to 988 or 988 to 911. 
uh, and how those calls will be transferred, um, whether it be cold or warm transfers, what information is to be given or what's the minimal information that needs to be given uh, to the, um, the, re the recipient um, center. So that kind of leads into a few questions I want to pose to the board. Um, there was a lot of discussion about whether we should be focusing on creating standards uh, or protocol recommendations for the board, or if this should be better addressed by one of the other working groups. Um, so I'll pose that question to the board and we can discuss that when appropriate. And if there's anything else that the board would like our working group to be looking into or, or addressing or covering. Um, so uh, with that, uh, Budge, I'll throw it back to you and answer any questions. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate that, that report. Uh, so open it up to the board. I have a couple of comments, but I'll, I'll give members of the board an opportunity first. So any feedback from the board on or questions for Jeff? There was a lot there, so... <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is Erica Didi Hirsch. Um, with that last question, focusing on standards and protocols, um, it is part of the bill that's available right now. I understand there's a new version, updated version that might come out after the trailer bill language is done, but that the state technical advisory board is to advise on the creation of standards and protocols for when 988 centers will transfer 988 calls into the 911 public safety answering points and vice versa. So that is something to my understanding that the board is charged with and based on your working group information collaboration, it sounds like you might be the most appropriate working group to do that work as of right now. So um, just procedurally, this board is charged with doing that. If we want the working group to do that, we can. So we just need to make a motion for them to do it, vote on it, and then Jeff's on the hook to deliver it to us. So, okay, so this is, this, is, this is learning for me. So, but no, your point is valid so that we can have a conversation around that recommendation. Um, you know, just anybody have any conversation around making that recommendation? If, if not, then we could just make a motion, second it, and, and do the vote, and Jeff will do the work. So I think, I think it would be helpful for me to understand when there's this level of work, because there's standards and protocols might have a legal definition that not all of us have a full grasp of. So this type of work conducted in other advisory boards, how has it typically been done and with what resources? Yeah, so there's a couple of ways this can be done. So obviously in the statute, there's certain authority given to HHS, certain authority given to Cal OES. And then this board is an advisory board to help HHS and OES accomplish what's in the statute. So kind of the way this works, we as a board are charged with making recommendations that could be completely ignored if they wanted to. Of course, that never really happens. I mean, the whole idea of an advisory board is to get good ideas that then you can figure out the statutory and, and uh, limitations that you might need to overcome to put a recommendation in place. So I think this board should be more focused on making a recommendation of how to get things done and then let the state agencies who are more familiar with statute have access to legal counsel, legislative experts to figure out if what the board is being recommend, what the board is recommending is actually possible. Um, so that way we don't have to worry about that, Erica, so much of we, we can be a little more open in our thought process of what you want to get done, make the recommendation to, to the appropriate agency, whoever is, is in the lead for that. And then we'll come back and tell you what barriers we see to implement it. And it could be a resource barrier. It could be a finance barrier. It could be a statutory barrier. It could be a policy barrier, something like that. Um, so does that, does that help Erica to just, that way you don't have to be so worried about, is this okay to do under the law? That's kind of why I have the state agencies involved in the conversation. Is that pretty, okay. Making sure I didn't get, you know, overruled by legal counsel. <laughs> All right, so go ahead, Jeff. So um, let me let me help clarify the the question. We we as a working group can easily identify 
things that probably need to be addressed by way of a um, standard protocols, whatever you want to call it. And maybe we can bring those uh, identified issues to the, the advisory board um, and then follow the process that you just described, as opposed to us having to create them. Um, I, I'm, I'm fine within the working group to do that if that's what the board wants. Um, but I, I think it might be better if we, we just identify where, well, clearly there will be need to be a standard or a set of standards or protocols around this particular item or this particular um, uh, function, et cetera. And, and maybe if we identify that as a working group, we can bring it back to the board for determination decision. Um, that would be my recommendation. I just wanted to make sure that I'm, I'm receiving the, the, I want the input of the board uh, determination of, of where we should be including that, if at all, within our working group. Okay, thank you. So does that does that help? Does anybody else on the board have any questions on that? It's so basically what Jeff's saying is the working group would take a look at what's out there, leverage the information that Tracy is doing in terms of best practices, come together and make a recommendation. We as a board look at that. Do we want to accept that recommendation and push it forward? Then it's up to Cal OES in this case to put something formally down as this is the way that it would go. Yeah, go ahead, Serena. Okay, so my question is, so as far as um, the 911 center taking the um, the psych call, then we determine, okay, there's no medical, um, okay, it meets the criteria basically to, trans to transfer them to 988. And then at what point does 988 um, determine it needs to go back to 911? Or, you know, like what uh, what what are their triggers to say, okay, I've been either on this phone for two hours or we aren't getting nowhere or it's getting worse, you know what I mean? And then at what point do we, um, as 911, do we then, do they transfer it over and say, okay, the, back to you guys, you know? So do, has that been determined yet or? I, I think, and, and Jeff, I don't know if you've had this conversation, but in other best practices I've looked at, regardless of where the call originated, 911, 98, warm line, one of those origination points, once it arrives in either entity, you've mm -hmm. made the determination to get there, you're back in the same decision metrics. Let's say that 911 takes the call, it's determined this is really 98, it goes to 988, and now threats are made against population, the weapon is the, you know, there's certain things that would come in where it'd be like, wait a minute, this needs to go back to 911. Mm -hmm. um, it's the same decision tree. Once it arrives in either system, you could then potentially de-escalate something that came from 988 over to 911. It de-escalates, maybe it goes back to 988. I think you'd have to have both mechanisms in the policy. Yeah, that's a, that's an excellent question. Oh, thank you. And our working group didn't get to that degree. We just recognize that there's a need for it, whatever that criteria protocols are for both sides. Um, but I... Uh, I mean, we talked about a lot, obviously, so we didn't have the time, but we also didn't want to dive into that if it wasn't appropriate for us to do. Um, but clearly there's an identified, there there needs to be a need, so there's consistency. So every PSAP, for example, is using the same set of protocols and determining to transfer to 988 and, and vice versa, 988, knowing when to engage emergency response from law enforcement, fire, or, or EMS. All right, so... I think we have already put that um, you know, request on the working group to come up with those recommendations, but um, I'd have to go back and read the minutes from the February meeting, but we could certainly be clearer um, in you know, this meeting now that we would want them to develop sort of a, a set of, um, I don't know, we'll call them considerations that need to be taken into account. Um, some of the questions we've been asked by in some of our conversations on the 911 side are, what's the answer time? In other words, when I push a call over to 988, 911, you know, we work in seconds, you know, 988 works in minutes, right? Just scalable. Um, so how long do you, would you like for them to be able to answer, you know, in a, in a perfect world? 10 seconds, 15 seconds of when you initiate that transfer to 988 and then vice versa, the handoff between, you know, how, how do you facilitate that? So I think it's those kind of things we'd like the working group to look at 
I have no idea how we would word that in a recommendation, but I'm willing to entertain a motion in a second if somebody wants to try it out. I'm looking at Erica. <laughs> But I think generally we would support the working group looking at um, standards or protocols or recommendations on how to make the determination to move the call between 988 and 911. Any further discussion on that? Buds, this is Tracy Gonzalez. Hey, Tracy, go ahead. Um, so what the uh, again the, some of the programs in the other states are doing when it comes to dispatch truly getting involved in that like um the base screening is um they use the lifeline safety assessment model for suicide so asking the questions um as far as um was it, it was like if you have been um considering or tried suicide in the last three, three days and if you've done it today and of course all the the people in the room that are way familiar, more familiar with this model than I am <laughs> know those questions, but that there, there's a list of questions that dispatchers actually have to go through to really truly triage to know whether or not they can transfer or not, or if it requires um, a PD or fire response instead. So there are some um, other states that are using those models um, to do that already. Right, thank you, Tracy. And I know there's some agencies that are on this board that have models in place already. So yeah. um, there's a good body of knowledge. I think the goal, and I, I know I've heard Stephanie mention this many times, the goal is for us to produce a policy that works for everybody, that's not overly prescriptive, where you leave an agency out, but is yet you know um, informative enough that we make sure that the help that somebody's seeking is available uh, in the right way. So um, I that would be, you know, what I'm hearing from this conversation. I don't know, Jeff, beyond the original charge you've been given, do you think you need any further guidance to continue that, or like it be a formal motion, or do you think you've got what you need to move forward as a working group? I actually think I have enough what I need um, just because the conversation naturally kept going to standards and protocols. I just wanted to make sure from the board's perspective that we weren't um, diving into an area that wasn't intended for us, but I, I'm fine with that. And then and the way I see it is, is where we identify those areas where there's a need for standards or protocols, and then what they might even be, I can bring back as a recommendation from the working group to the board to do with whatever the board wants to do. Right. And ultimately, we'll have to tie into the implementation plan that HHS is developing and the long-term goals. Right. So yes. And that's kind of the role of the board. What we're looking for the working group is for you to give us um, those initial set of recommendations that we can then, then discuss and vote on. That, that works for me. I don't think there's a, a need for a, a motion to present to the board to be able to do that because, I, like I said, it was just naturally occurring in our conversations. Okay. And then there were a couple other things that, that Jeff mentioned, the EPRC, which is the lookup feature that is built into the integrated platform, the ability to look at services available throughout the state that is something that's in the technical requirements as well, and the ability to share data is in the technical requirements. The how you do those different things is a whole nother question, but the technical abilities we did consider, so just so that you're aware, um, those are in the current contract. All right, so public comment, go ahead. Um, oh, the, she's aboard. Yes, yeah, so go ahead, Lisa Ann. Thanks, Budge. I think Sherry had her hand up to above uh, before me, if, if that matters. But um, uh, mine it was mostly a comment for Jeff. Um, just there's already um, several, you know, a, a vast amount of policies and protocols that are established for 988 crisis centers. So just in those best practice dialogues, um, you know, we might make sure we're defaulting to what already exists or if that if there needs to be improvement on those, but um, those are something that nationwide centers and statewide um, that we're already following. And so it would be really easy to go down a rabbit trail that we don't need to go down possibly. Uh, by not looking at those first. 
All right, Jeff, and hopefully you've got members on your working group that are aware of that body of knowledge um, and can reach out and, and get that information. Awesome. All right, any other comments from the board before we open it up to public comment? Go ahead, Stephanie. I think just on that point to be very specific, I know that um, the 12 crisis centers have been getting together for over two years um, in preparation for this. And so um, just maybe we could make sure that someone from that group is on this working group to, to help um, make sure that you have all of the information and thinking that that group has already done in this space. Um, so we can help with that if that's not happening right now. And Lisa Ann is another board member who, who probably could, not that you need to participate in a, in a working group, but certainly is very looped into what's happening uh, outside of this particular working group and could really help with sharing that knowledge. Oh, no, I'd, I'd be happy to. Uh, I'm sure there are others who would too, but I, I thought I even tried to reach out to be part of that work group. So um, uh, sign me up, Jeff. So Jeff, yeah, I apologize unless I must have missed that. Um, but but we do have participants from, you know, from, from D.B. Hirsch and everything. We, we are dialed into that, I believe. I just, we need to be cautious of how many uh, uh, members of from this advisory board participate so we don't run into um, a quorum. I think we're, how many do we have for, how many do we need for a quorum, Budge? Remind me. You can have up to seven members in the working group from the advisory board and not establish a quorum. Okay, so I, I believe we're at four or five. We'll have to double check that. So that's the only thing I would be um, concerned about, about uh, additional participants from the advisory board. But I do believe we have those voices there um, as, as part of that conversation. They were providing that data, um, but it was still evident that there is still um, uh, disparity in how everybody is doing something from the 988 side, largely because um, of the different resources they have available. Some parts of the, of the state have uh, no access to mobile crisis response teams. Other have uh, others have like a almost full integration with mobile crisis response teams. So there there still are some differences between the centers, is what the the ob my observation was in those conversations. But yes, those I, I think we have the right participants right now. It's just further delving into uh, the different areas. Uh, this is uh, as as everybody can uh, you know tell. This is a lot of information to have to address. Um, we we met for three hours. And I still felt like we could continue to talk. So um, I think it's just going to take us time to, to dive in um, to each of those, as, especially not knowing right now what the, the deployment of the call handling solution uh, and its capability. So appreciate I appreciate you uh, commenting on that, Budge, to answer some of those technology questions, because that will play a, a large role in, in, in our discussions. Okay. All right. Any other comments from board members? Okay, so comments from the public. I think we have Sherry that has a comment. So go ahead, Sherry. Hi, thanks, Budge. Uh, just a couple of things. Um, so I do think that Sandri is either has participated or is trying to connect and participate in this group from DD Hirsch and has been um, obviously very involved in 988-911 um, collaborations on our LAPD project. So I think can really help in and providing some insight on, you know, best practices, both nationally and, and locally in California, if she if she hasn't already, Jeff, I think you all have connected. Um, yes, she, she is a participant. Yeah, that's what I thought. Good. Um, secondly, um, I also just wanted to note, um, there seems like, at least for me, I'm a little unclear, and I think partly going back to what, what Erica was asking earlier, you know, what what exactly is going to be coming from this work group. So I, I really do appreciate that conversation that was happening earlier about, about, you know, kind of, you know, who has what authority or what's, what's going to be being produced. Um, we've been getting, I, and I guess, let me tell you what I mean by that. We've been getting lots of questions like from, from our counties, from local law enforcement organizations, you know, about, you know, who's sort of, taking the lead on developing some of these policies and procedures. And, you know, they're kind of going some down some of these rabbit holes too. And we're sort of saying, well, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is this is happening in this other work group on the state level. And we're, you know, we just don't want too many rabbit holes happening all over the place. And we're trying to coordinate some of that. So I think it would be really helpful 
um, you know, to kind of just state specifically what what people can be expecting to come out of this work group um, so that we can be telling people that or you can be telling somebody can be telling people that, um, you know, because I, I think that, you know, the more we can coordinate what's happening and people can kind of be knowing what to look for, I think would be really helpful. Um, so I just I just wanted to underscore that. Um, and then my last comment actually goes back to the question that I had in the chat earlier um, and kind of um, when I was asking if there was a document to point to and Budge, you said that we could email if we wanted to get connected to any of these work groups. It's actually not for me. I know who to email, but like people are asking me all the time about these work groups and what are they and who do they contact? And I'm just wondering, is there like a flyer or a link or something that that I don't have to explain them in my words because I don't want to mess them up? Is there just something that I can say, hey, here, take a look and shoot them off an email and say, this is what they are? Such a document does not exist now, um, but that's something we could probably produce. I think it would be uh, awesome. All right. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So um, for my team, um, those that are working directly with the working groups, just so that's Anita, Don, and Marisol. Uh, as you're working with your particular working groups, draft something up on what you think they're working on. Validate with the chair that that is what they're working on. We'll put it formal and get it posted to our website. Thank you. We'll try so and get much. that done. I don't know, you think... 30 days is enough time to do that, team. I'm looking at them. They're shaking their heads. So we'll try and get that done in the next 30 days so that um, that's more publicly accessible. Okay, Sherry, that's a great recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments from the public on that? All right, moving on to the, the, the uh, final working group. Um, so this is the Accessibility and Equal Access Working Group. Um, the co-chairs are Dr. Goldman, who... Um, thank you for your service. We're going to find a, another um, person to, to take the charge on that and Stephanie. So I don't know which of the two of you wants to give a brief report on what you've been doing. Yeah, I'll I'll start and then um, pass it over to Dr. Goldman if he wants to add anything. Um, we've had a chance to meet once uh, as well. Uh, we just formed. Um, I'm going to quickly just run through um, and share uh, our approach to this. Um, we felt that it was really, we wanted to have a group of subject matter experts to start, um, partly because of the complexity of the two issues. Um, and so we did some recruiting um, from our kind of networks of folks that we know. And so um, I have added some experts from our various different departments. So uh, that includes um, a few equity officers, one from the California Department of Aging, uh, another from the Department of Social Services, um, also um, a, a deputy director from our Office of Health Equity at our Department of Public Health. Um, we also did some outreach to our department. And um, again, this is, I forgot to mention, this is the Accessibility and Equal Access Work Group. Um, uh, we did some outreach to our Department of Rehab and have some uh, two people joining us, one who's really an, an expert on the technology and accessibility pieces, and the other who's on kind of more the, the cultural issues around the disability community and making sure that things are equitable. Um, we also did some outreach to some, some uh, peer advocates and uh, people who have been impacted um, by behavioral health crisis who are leaders nationally in this space, including Karis Myrick. Um, and on the ADA technology piece, um, Richard Ray, who I think was a recommendation from all of you guys, who's really fantastic, um, and a woman by the name of um, Rebecca Neuster, um, who is uh, out of Chicago, but does a lot of work in this space as well. And I'm sure that there are particular people that I'm missing. I think we also had from our Department of Developmental Services, somebody who is an autism specialist. So, um, very large charge for this particular group. So just to, as a refresher, um, we, in our, it, again, we only had one meeting. I'd have to say that the meeting was really about um, these subject matter experts getting to know each other and to have a better understanding of their area of expertise in this large kind of uh, bucket of work that needs to be done. So, so that, so, <coughs> excuse me, the two buckets that people are, that we're gonna focus on would be first, you know, accessibility, which is really referring to 
ensuring that technology allows for accessibility by special populations, including individuals who are developmentally uh, disabled or intellectually uh, delayed, um, people who have uh, physical um, disabilities as well. You know, this could include the use of appropriate video technology for communications, um, ensuring that there is a robust chat response and other accessibility issues. On the equitable access piece, this is really referring to ensuring that there are protocols to address cultural barriers and concerns, including culturally relevant communications uh, and clear protocols regarding 988 and get this 988 and 911 interoperability and communication to our cultural groups, uh, her, our cultural groups, so that they understand uh, what the relationship is between 988 and 911. So we've landed on. Uh, focusing on 90 minute meetings um, every few months um, so that we can have a meeting uh, shortly before the next meeting that we have of this group. Um, and I think I will probably turn it over to Dr. Goldman. I was not able to participate in all of the conversation that we had in our very first meeting, um, but just to kind of reflect on some of the other points that have been made in terms of um, access to the working groups. It's not like we're trying to be exclusive by any means. I think it was partly just, could we manage this many people and could we manage this many topics? Just like what I've heard as an underscoring. Um, I think the other thing with this particular work group that is work that, that we will do internally um, is think through what issues really need to be the focus First of all, now at this very point, what is the most urgent that needs to be worked on? And then second, um, what are the kinds of things that really should be more within the realm of the policy conversation in this space? And to be fully transparent, one of the reasons I wanted to help co-chair this particular work group is that I knew that it would be a working group that would be uh, uh, needed and, and really importantly and uh, necessary in our policy advisory group. And so I think I had mentioned this last time we were here is thinking through, you know, not now, but in the future, how can we ensure that that also the work that these working groups are doing is informing um, the, the process that will kick off later this summer for the 90 day policy and planning. So Budge and I can maybe grapple with how that mechanically could work, but um, certainly I think at the end of even this calendar year, we're going to have like a core group of experts that we're all working with who interchangeably might be interacting with, with uh, a variety of working groups between both the technical advisory board and then the policy advisory board. So that's all I have to, to share. We did um, we did land on having another or a meeting date, and so I'm happy to work with the staff to think through uh, and also with the members of this committee on you know, how can we make this open? I don't I don't necessarily want to say open to the public because I think we have a lot of very specific work to do. Um, but then there, we're it's perfectly fine to be transparent. It's not like we're talking about something that we don't want to share with the public. It's just a matter of managing getting the work done in 90 minutes within a reasonable number of people on on the committee. Um, so Dr. Goldman, I don't know if you're still on the line, but is there anything you want to share as well from from the conversation. Um, yeah, thank you. No, I think you you covered um, you know all of the key points. The the one thing that I did just want to add and give a little voice to, which did come up in the latter part of our meeting, was just to acknowledge that these are two very large topics, like accessibility for all language populations, for people with disabilities, including um, people who are deaf or blind. Like there's there's a lot in that whole area and then there's also a whole lot under the area of equity and um, equitable access especially as it relates to social justice issues to experiences of discrimination and to known disparities um, with access to mental health services and so we address that very explicitly in our conversation given that we had just brought together this group for the very first time and Honestly, I was a little concerned that we were lumping two big topics that were maybe too large in a single group, but um, there was really consensus that that was okay. Um, I think that there was acknowledgement that um, these issues of access largely hinge around communications and how are we really signaling to the public what these programs are. And then importantly, for the purview of this board, like 
how is 911 actually involved with 988 and really emphasizing transparent communication as one of the key strategies to improving access. Um, and the other point that um, really clearly came up was that there are many intersections between um, uh, difficulty accessing mental health services among um, people uh, with uh, disabilities or who uh, uh, speak non-English languages versus, as well as people who are in BIPOC communities who experience um, uh, difficulty with access to services for um, discriminatory or other um, sort of structural issues uh, that, that um, the, I think that the, the intersections between these were uh, widely acknowledged as prominent and um, a potential benefit of actually having these two large topics in a single work group. So just wanted to acknowledge that because it came up there and I think it's important for us to be explicit that this is really intentional how we're approaching this. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the report out from both of you. Any questions from the board um, regarding the accessibility and uh, equal access working group? All right, any comments online that you're seeing? All right, we know it's a huge topic. We thank you for tackling it. We know it's a long and ongoing conversation and, and a lot of it's result revolves around um, perception on the public side and then obviously the ability of the technology to facilitate what you guys are seeing. So um, we appreciate the work you're doing there. One of the things that, um, and I'm probably gonna kick myself later for suggesting this, but I do think that if it's helpful, we can at least put together like some minutes from when we have these working groups and make that publicly accessible and also just disseminate to all the other board members, if that's helpful um, uh, to make sure that people can read kind of what the discussion was when we did meet as a working group, if that's, you know, if that's helpful to people. I, I think that would be helpful from each working group. Um, so we'll circle back with the working groups to do the flyer idea that um, Sherry brought up. That's a great idea. And then as you have the minutes um, generated, my team will be present there to kind of document that from a staffing perspective. Uh, we'll vet it through the board chair, you know, through the chair of the working group to make sure we've captured the idea right. Um, and then we can just make those accessible and put them on our website. Hopefully before our meeting, um, that will be our goal. But a lot of that will depend on when the working group um, gets the information to us. Uh, but ideally, in a perfect world, those come to us a couple of weeks before our board meeting. Uh, then we have the time to do the uh, ADA compliance because accessibility to the document is a key part of what we do. Um, and that takes time. And then we can post those on our website uh, prior to the board. I, I think that would be a, a wonderful workflow if we could get that going. All right, so I think um, that that finishes up agenda item number five, which uh, was really the bulk of our conversation. We would really wanted to focus this discussion in on, on some of what's happening at the working group level. I'm gonna move on to agenda item number six. These are the standing items. And of course, um, uh, if you wanna click on the screen for the slides, because my little clicker's not working. Just click your mouse anywhere. There we go, thank you. Uh, so these are the standing items that we have, uh, the board has requested the OES to report out on. We will at some point have a 988 system director until that time I am the 988 system director. So I'm happy to serve in this role. I'm really excited about this topic. So a uh, couple of these things are gonna be duplicative um, from the last meeting. I didn't wanna remove the link for the contract that we have out there. If anyone's wondering, what is in these technical requirements? There are about 600 requirements that you can read through at that link. Uh, there's a lot. So if you have any questions regarding what is and is not in scope of the contract, we of course can help you. We did have a kickoff meeting. We finished the detailed site surveys at all 12 locations. And you know we you know, walked them through, here's the vendor. We did a facility walk, figured out the gaps that exist at each of the um, Facilities did a detailed workflow analysis of all the group one sites and uh, started that conversation with group two. And if you're wondering, group one, group two, what are you talking about? Um, we look at, looked at the complexity and kind of the role of each of these centers and our ability to get them on board sooner rather than later. And this is the breakdown that we came up with in terms of who's in group one, who's in group two. 
And really we focused on, we want success in the project. We've learned that uh, the largest agency shouldn't necessarily go first. So sorry, Didi Hirsch, um, you're large and complex and we need time to learn your workflows before we jump into that, uh, into the deep end of the pool. So this is the list that we've come up with and um, my team is working on the rollout. Our goal is to try and have um, these centers active in by the end of the the second quarter, beginning of the third quarter of this year. And uh, we're on track to do that, provided a couple of things happen. We've also established a meeting cadence with all 12 centers. We've tried to be very careful here because as Stephanie alluded to, the centers have already been meeting for a couple of years um, under the leadership of Didi Hirsch and um, their contract they have with um, DHCS. We want to be respectful of that, but at the same time, our conversations are focused on the technology and the rollout and what we need to do to implement the solution. So we're developing those um, those meeting cadence. And I really want to give a shout out to Kirk Gallat on my team, who's the project manager here. He's taken the brunt of this. I come to him with all my crazy ideas. He tells me no to half of them and then implements the other half, putting his spin and direction and focus on them, which is just wonderful. And um, so we're making some good progress here. I, I want to pause at this point because I'm assuming there could be some questions, and then um, my next slide is is to go in some of our next steps. So I want to see if anybody has any questions for me before I uh, move on to what we we're going to be doing next in the project. Any comments from the board or any comments online? <laughs> Kurt, yeah, Kurt is amazing, and uh, I will echo that. <laughs> Yeah, he's in the room uh, for those that don't know. So uh, he's got a big smile on his face, which we will quickly suppress with more work. <laughs> All right. So moving on to, to kind of what we're doing now, we've installed 98 equipment in our lab um, and we're beginning that testing. A lot of that testing is focusing on the interaction between 911 and 988 and the call flows that are there. There's some unique things we're doing from a technology perspective that aren't being done in other places. We want to test that. Really getting into this deep dive workflow analysis, there's been a lot of conversation about the CRM, um, the customer relationship um, management software, that piece of what data is stored, how are you supporting the workflow that needs to happen as was mentioned by Tracy, 85% of these calls that come in are just handled by the expertise of the counselor, leveraging the resources they've got available to help the person that, that's seeking that, you know, that assistance. So it's a big part of the tool. We understand that. We've been in conversations with Vibrant about the engineering and connectivity. Um, for those of you that are technical, there might be some CIOs out there that are listening um, chief information officers. So we want to meet Vibrant at a, at a location, obviously redundant meet points, bring all the calls, chats, and texts into California, and then route them to the centers the way they are now. And then as we bring a center online and validate that the software that we're providing meets their workflow, we transition that call flow to go through the unified platform. That's the goal at a high level of what we're trying to do. And so far, we've had um, really good conversations with Vibrant. Uh, the one piece that's missing is specific dates of when those meet points will be established. Really difficult for us to establish a transition plan if we don't have a firm date. Uh, we are working with them. And then we're also de determining sort of this, um, we use the term minimally viable solution where we're only going to pay, I think it's up to 80% of the monthly recurring costs because it's not the full solution. When we wrote the RFP, like I said, there's 600 things in there, roughly. I think it's about that many, it's literally that many. Um, some are absolutely critical to have now, and others are things we're going to build into the platform over time. What do we absolutely need to have now to support the workflow in these centers that are in group one? And what are the things that we can take a few months um, to develop or a couple of quarters to develop and integrate into the solution later? That's the conversation we're having right now. Um, every center is different. We're used to this. We have 450 PSAPs that we support on the 911 side, and there's 800 different ways that they want to do things. Um, so we're very familiar with that mindset. We'll do our best to, to hit the mark, and, and that's really the work that, that Kurt and the team are doing. 
And so that's where we're at right now. We want to begin that activation, like I said, second and third quarters of this year. And then those group two piece apps toward the end of this year and the beginning of next year will, will be the goal. There are some concerns over timelines and requirements, and we're having a difficult time determining, determining the difference between a need to have and a must to have requirement. In other words, do you absolutely have to be 24 seven, 365 chat, text and calls to be considered a 988 center? And if so, when? When is the state making that mandate? When is SAMHSA making that mandate? And then finding the actual authority to prescribe that level of service. I think we certainly want to get there as a goal. Um, and then determining some other things like uh, the data that needs to be reported, how do we report that data? How do we make it accessible to those that need that information? And how do we report it out? I think there's some other things we're working on right now in terms of, of timelines. There's a lot of concern. I think we have three centers now that are taking chat and text, or is it two? It's either two or three. Yeah, in, in group group two. And, and obviously we want everybody there. Um, everybody's not there yet. So how do we make that transition? Um, those that want to do it now and might be in group two, should they go with Vibrant first, then transition to this new one? Does that make sense? Uh, we're having those conversations now. Um, and so that's part of the work that, that Kurt and his team are doing. We recognize that no one wants to be trained twice, trained once, and then six months later, trained again. So we're trying to move our timelines forward as much as possible so that does not happen. Um, I think those are some of the big things that we've been um, tracking. Uh, happy to pause here and entertain any questions from the board or, or on this. Go ahead. Yes. I'm going to take this back to a very elementary level, but when, um, how does this all relate to whether or not there'll be geolocation? Is that a, like a dumb question? I hope it's not, but like, it, I guess it is we not. Keep, it's we a keep great thinking question. It might happen and like, I, could you help it it's enlighten a, me? Okay. It's a great question. So initially, there is absolutely not geolocation. Calls are routed by area code. We will continue to deliver by area code because that's all we have. Um, and we know that's not the best path. The one advantage the unified platform gets is once you deliver by area code, not changeable in today's environment, and it's received in the system, and the help seeker either identifies where they're at, or we push them a link and we know where they're at, or there's some other means used to determine where they are, we can then geospatially route the call at that point anywhere within our system. So there's, there's that huge advantage, which does not exist outside of the unified platform. There, there's no mechanism to do that in other 988 delivery platforms. So we're, that's one thing we're bringing. So when we determine, we know an address, or, or we at least know which center, 988 center received the call, we can geospatially route to the right 988 center at that point. If we know the address or the location, we can absolutely do it. If we ask them and they tell us, and they're telling the truth, we can actually get them to the right center. Or if there's exigent circumstances, there's some other tools that we may have access to where we can make that location determination, we can geospatially route at that point. So ultimately, and this is something that, you know, this board could consider, if this geolocation question is that critical, the board could write a letter to the FCC to see if they want to expedite the FCC's proceedings on this. That's certainly possible for the board to write such a letter. I'm sure the FCC, um, it's called an ex parte. You write it outside of any rulemaking that they're doing and you just write them a letter and say, hey, this is critical and this is why and this is what we recommend. And so the board could do that. We could absolutely do that. It would be a little challenging to write said letter in a public way. But if that's something the board wants to do, um, we could certainly write a letter, pass it to the board for review uh, at the next meeting, and then uh, send it off to the FCC. It would take time to do such a thing, but we certainly could. So long answer to a short question. Can I ask a follow-up question? Um, do you have a general sense of when this decision could potentially take place? I, I, I know my update is in a moment, but I know that um, we have a particular administration now at the federal level, as well as here 
here in California that's really, really supportive of this. So um, thinking about the fact that that uh, 2024 is around the corner and we'll have an election year, I'm just kind of curious, wouldn't want to miss this opportunity with um, what we have at both a federal government and a local government who are very, very interested in this. If there's some, if there's anything that we could do, it seems as if it would be really helpful for this to be in place sooner rather than later. Um, and there's just significant federal and state investments going into 988 and mobile crisis response um, right now. So anyways, I guess that was maybe not a question, more of a comment, but um, I, I just have no idea. I would have no idea if it's like 10 years away or is it two years away? I have no idea. So the FCC um, did a notice of proposed rulemaking on the reliability of 988, and they started that after the outage that happened in October, and they still have not made any determination. Um, they they put the report and order out, they've gathered comments, they haven't made any decisions yet. There is an upcoming FCC hearing where that's going to be a topic of discussion. I say all that to understand the process of the FCC. They haven't even started the process to look at location um, routing for 988. Um, there's some organization that introduced in their comments, you can't really have an outage reporting system if you don't even know where the call is. And you don't know where the call is because you're doing area code routing, which is not an accurate mechanism. So if the system's down, who do you tell it's down? You don't even know where they are. Right. If I'm 916 and I'm traveling to Washington, D.C. and I need mental health support, which is a, a common occurrence um, on both occasions, uh, then I call, you know, when I actually call 988, I end up back in California and not with somebody locally who might have the resources to help me. So it's those kinds of questions that are being asked. So I think a letter could help expedite the process. So um, if the board wanted to entertain that motion, we could we could do something along those lines. Can we, can we think about it and take it up at the next meeting Absolutely. as an action item? Okay. Yeah. So um, just if you want to agendize it for the next uh, meeting, we would need it a couple of weeks, minimum a couple of weeks before, but by like the beginning of August. So I can get it on an agenda and make it public because the agenda has got to be published 10 days prior. So your your good idea um, calendar runs out on August 1st uh, and maybe a little before that if I want to get it through my approval process. I don't know, Meg, if you want to add to that. This is Meg Wilson, legal counsel. So I'm just thinking the best way to go about this because we can't have a, a serial meeting. It all has to be done public is maybe the best way would be for Cal OES or someone on your team budge to draft a letter and then you know, circulate that letter with the agenda so members of the public could see it and board members could see it in advance and then go over kind of editing the letter in a public forum. Um, so it's going to take a, like an extra meeting. So I just want Stephanie to be aware. So even if the motion to even do a letter doesn't come out until next board meeting, you probably couldn't even edit the letter until the prior meeting, unless you had a letter rearing to go. <laughs> well, this is Jeff. Go ahead, Jeff. Um, I think with this discussion, I agree. I think an ex parte communication with the FCC from this board is is warranted. Um, I'd be concerned about waiting um, that long, and so I'd be um, I'd be willing to offer a motion that this board authorize Cal OES to draft a letter for us to review and and vote on uh, for the next meeting. All right, we have a motion from Jeff or Cal OES to do an ex parte letter to the FCC on uh, location, 988 and location routing. So any discussion from any other board members? All right, do we have a second on that? I second. We have a second from Erica. All right, we'll go to a vote. And by the way, you can vote no. There's, so, you know, just keep that in mind. Um, so Deputy Secretary Welch? Yes. All right. I think I have to skip over Dr. Goldman, right? Well, he's still on this one, yeah. All right, Dr. Goldman? Are you there? I'm here, sorry, struggling to unmute. Um, yes, I vote yes. All right, yes. Do we have to do public comment before we vote on them? Probably, right? Yeah. All right, sorry, I didn't ask for members from the, from the public. 
So can you read those? Because there's no way I might be able to read it here. All right. So Matt Taylor is saying, here's a link to the public recording about a year ago, geolocation on 988. Yes, I think I have listened to that. And the FCC has received many comments and letters on this, Matt. Okay, Matt, I, I'm absolutely agreeing with you. Do you want to make any further comments? Yes, everyone. Uh, again, Matt Taylor, the new director of 988 at D.D. Hirsch for the 988 Network. Um, I just, it's just a comment that the FCC has been deliberating on the issue of geolocation for a number of years and has received vigorous public comment, including from state agencies, the call centers, Vibrant, uh, and uh, even members within SAMHSA about the challenges that the lack of geolocation does uh, create. There are obviously uh, perhaps not a surprise to this group, but a number of concerns about privacy and uh, a little bit different from uh, 911. So at, at this point, um, I would you know go back to what was being said before that once a call is within the system, if a person is willing to disclose their location, then yes, of course, uh, the the call could get routed clearly to the most appropriate center where the person closest to where the person is standing. There's also the option, of course, of like course location where it's pinged off of cell towers, but uh, not exactly the same level of information as where the person is literally standing. Um, but right now, uh, just to, again, so everybody's clear, when Vibrant uh, receives a 988 contact, we're speaking of calls here, the system reads first the area code and then the three-digit extension, the next three digits of the phone number, and routes the caller to a center, uh, which has agreed to provide coverage for that area. And so the majority of calls do land at the center's um, you know, close to where a person is, but until uh, strict geolocation is put into place, if if that comes, uh, we don't have an uh, an ability at the front end uh, to manage that. So we really are relying on when callers disclose that kind of information uh, once they're at, at a call center or within the future California 988 Unified Platform. Okay, thank you, Matt. I appreciate that. All right, so... Um... Based on that public comment, I'm going to start the the uh, the voting over. Um, anyone have any further discussion before we? I have a question. I'm sorry. Uh, we're asking we're asking them to expedite a rulemaking process. We are not weighing in on what the rule is. Correct. correct. Okay, that's what I thought, but I wanted to clarify before I voted. All right. Um, so we'll go back to the beginning. Deputy Secretary Welch. Yes. All right, Dr. Goldman. Yes. All right, thank you. Director Aiello. Yes. All right, Director Wick. Yes. Erica. Yes. All right. Let's see. Kristen Miller. Oh, I don't think she's here. Uh, Armitus. Yes. I'm sorry, Demetrius. My mistake on your pronunciation. Jeff no. Bear. Yes. All right. Tracy Gonzalez. Yes. All right. Jennifer Kenton. She's still on. All right. Dr. Poon. Uh, yes. All right, thank you. And let's see, Aaron Riley is not on, Jennifer Dwyer? Yes. And Serena Lewis? Yes. All right, so we do have a majority. And so um, OES will bring forth a letter. And at the August meeting, um, we'll add that to the agenda and we'll review the letter. We will circulate the draft ahead of time because we cannot have a serial meeting. So please do not respond to the letter we circulate. Um, we will have to discuss it in open meeting. And if you've never done a, a public editing of a document, you are in for some real fun. <laughs> so that's what we have look, for, look forward to in August. We will do our best to get it right. Um, and we will focus on uh, making sure that we're not saying anything controversial, that we're simply focusing on asking them to take some action sooner rather than later, okay?
All right. I think um, I was in the middle of an update. Any other questions related to the call handling solution and the CRM solution that we're working on? We're, we're effect, affectionately calling the unified platform. Any other comments or questions on that? Okay. The next topic um, on this, if you'll advance the slide for me, there we go, thank you, um, is the 911 to 980 interface. This was a standing agenda item for us. I think the working group discussed most of this. The one thing we had in here is the reasonable time. We've kind of already discussed that. And we've also heard some feedback on an IP lookup, if that be available in the platform or we're asking our vendor. Um, this would be for a chat that comes in over a chat session where all you've got is an IP address where we have an automated way within the platform to look that up. We're still in conversations with our vendor to see what that might look like. So any other questions related to um, item 6.2, 911 to 988 interface? We had a pretty robust discussion on that. All right, seeing but, and hearing oh, done. Oh, but sorry, just, go ahead online. Sorry, it's Lisa Ann. Um, just one question on that IP address. Um, does that also give you the um, internet service provider? Is that part of your workflow on that? We would love for it to be able to determine the internet service provider and the location of the person chatting. We just don't know if it's technically possible. Yeah, yeah. I, I just know those are the items that, you know, are the most helpful. Um, yeah. I, I think on this one, and this is just me, you know, know what I know in the space, there may need to be some regulation in place to support this to compel the internet service providers under certain conditions to disclose yeah. location. And that I'm, I'm just thinking exigent circumstances, not general. Yep, that's exactly right. Yep. And how do we document that and reference the applicable laws and prove that we're doing this? And um, we've got some experience in this space on the 911 side. Usually the procedures are so onerous that it takes you half hour you know, to get through the process um, if you've yeah. ever tried this. And by then, yeah. you know, the the exigent circumstance could have had a bad outcome by then. And so- That is possible, but I will share, um, I, and I share this nationally oftentimes too, um, we've had many a good outcome um, with nothing but an IP address and um, in really dire circumstances. And so, you know, the at least if we build the capacity to do that, um, and we have a jurisdiction who's willing to do that, it can be really effective. Yeah, agreed. And so we're in conversations with the vendor to see how this, if this is possible, and if so, how long to implement. So we're we're certainly looking at this. We've heard it loud and clear, and we know the limitations, but we certainly want to provide this capability. Great. I know I'm preaching to the choir. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're we're on the same side, which is wonderful. All it right. Is. Uh, the next agenda item is is re relative to the 988 surcharge. I, I left this in here. I've gone over this at previous meetings. Uh, I'll keep this in there. I guarantee no matter how many times you go over this, you're probably going to have questions when you finally try and figure out what in the world is going on. Um, I will say this, um, both HHS, working in partnership with their departments, DHCS and others, and Cal OES have submitted separate budget change proposals to get authority to spend money that is in this surcharge 988 fee collection. We, state agencies, can do nothing with that money until we're given the budget authority to do it. So that's the step we're at now. Um, if you want to see where that's progressing, Stephanie and I cannot comment on it because it's part of a legislative process but there's open hearings and you can go see the status of these BCPs. If you go to the Department of Finance's website, you will see our actual proposals there, the current versions of them. Just do a search for California DOF BCP, select the current budget year, which is FY23-24, that's the one that starts in July, and then go to HHS, you'll see theirs, go to Cal OES, you'll see ours, it's all public documents. The only thing we can't comment on is the outcome because we don't know yet. It's in the middle of the budget process. Um, as soon as we get something, we will let you know and we will share and that should be at the August board meeting. We'll know because the budget is passed by June. So that's kind of where this is. 
Um, and these numbers are the money that's available in the fund. And that these numbers are based on the number of access lines reported to us. So this is started to be deposited in the 988 surcharge fund in January, but we, the state agencies, cannot touch it until we get budget authority to use it. So it's just being deposited in the fund. It's protected. It can only be used for 988. The statute was very well written to protect the funds. They're not going anywhere. They're not being used for anything else. We just need authority to start our portion of, of this work, which we will do as soon as it's granted, uh, whatever that outcome is. So, and then next year, we, you know, repeat the cycle, submit a different BCP or whatever we want to achieve. So any questions on that, uh, on the surcharge calculation and kind of where we are? All right, seeing, hearing none. Uh, next one is 98 uh, milestones. Um, the work that this board is doing uh, is actually been just amazing. So I thank you all for your participation. Thank you for the working group members uh, and leads that are, are doing that effort. We're getting a lot done in a rather short period of time. Uh, the, the statute was not even passed and signed into law until September of 2022. So in state policy timelines, this is light speed. So we're already in our third board meeting, which is remarkable. So I um, really appreciate what, what everybody is doing. Obviously, implementing the rest of the milestones are dependent on the budget requests we put in. We're able to do this now, um, Cal OES, because we put in a, a budget change proposal in 2022 that gave us the ability to do the technology. And that was really in response to the federal law that came out that implemented 988. AB 988 came later, so those activities were light on staff to execute them. Right now, our focus is on the technology implementation, which we, we had a year jump start on uh, the efforts from AB 988, if you're wondering how we're doing what we're doing. And plus, we just have an amazing team, really, really proud of what they're doing. At this point, Stephanie, I've given you a five minutes for an update before the end of the of the hour. Um, we've had a fairly robust conversation, but uh, we did want to give an update, uh, a quick update from HHS on, on what you're doing. So I'll turn the floor over to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, a couple of, uh, I think, important updates. One is, and this was not planned, but our um, RFP to implement um, our responsibilities related to AB 988 was posted today. So that's really uh, been a major piece of work that we've been working on in anticipation that we everything will go smoothly with the budget and uh, we, uh, we will be given the resources that we requested in order to execute um, our main responsibility, at least at Health and Human Services, which is to develop a five-year set of uh, five-year implementation plan set of recommendations. There are a couple of other things that we'll be looking for that we think are critical to do this work um, that maybe we're not specifically prescribed in um, AB 988. Um, so um, really excited to, to launch in and start doing that work. The other big update that I have today, um, and I will get this information to you, Budge, so you can share it out to whoever's on you know, this listserv or this body. Um, we did complete um, our crisis care continuum plan. It is, it is done. Um, it is still going through some ADA compliance issues as we refresh our website. Um, and that website will be a place where you can not only find the plan itself and review the plan, but also any kind of information that we are posting on a state level around uh, 98. Um, so there are hyperlinks in that on that website that take people back to SAMHSA and other information that they're pushing out. You know, I forgot to mention it May is Mental Health Month. This is a month in which we get a lot of um, typically a lot more. Uh, uptake in terms of, you know, discussion around mental health, um, of course, and we want that discussion to happen. And and I'm noticing in, in conversations around May is Mental Health Month um, that people are bringing up and mentioning the importance of calling 988. So it'll be interesting to see what our main numbers are for our, for our centers to see if those numbers went up. Um, whether you're watching your local news or <clears throat> you might be at a, <clears throat> I think there was a uh, a Giants game where there was some discussion of 988. So, so it's really exciting that it's starting to kind of take off. And one of the things that we we are asked to do 
um, is to work on a kind of communication strategy for the state on 988 as part of that five-year plan. Um, and so that's going to be a significant amount of, of work. I would acknowledge that um, as part of our BCPs, um, both Health and Human Services as well as two of our departments that have major roles in in uh, realizing the, the goals in AB 988, our Department of Healthcare Services and our Department of Managed Healthcare, which regulates commercially insur com uh, commercial insurance plans. Um, they also asked for some, for some resources to fulfill their obligations. Um, and we're you know, looking forward to getting started on, on that. Um, I think um, another piece that we're, is going through the process is the signing message um, for AB 988 by the governor directed our agency to do technical cleanup language um, on AB 988. We have um, put that trailer bill language out and have been um, meeting with stakeholders on uh, you know, what that trailer bill uh, says and does and um, look forward to wrapping up that as well so that we have real crystal clear clarity as to what we're supposed to do to, to realize the vision of AB 988. Um, I think one little bit of, uh, since we're talking about successes, and I, I really do want to lift up some of the performance issues for our crisis, uh, for our current 988 suicide and crisis call centers. Um, and uh, so, for example, um, I was looking at some data, and in its Three, it's three months, this is a three months average from last November through January. Um, and in total, there were over 70,000 contacts to our centers, including calls, chats, and text. But I think the part that's really interesting, um, and I think would be interesting for some of our stakeholders is that, you know, we whether or not we've talked very much about it in this space, I know it's something that gets talked about a lot when we're thinking about 988, and that is the connection to a mobile crisis response. Um, did want to lift up uh, two data points from this three-month average. One would be the percentage of contacts that resulted in an emergency rescue was just around 2%. So um, we have a 90% call rate, a call answer rate for our crisis call centers now which I think is probably one of the best in the country. Um, we also hands down have the most calls uh, to our 988 centers. And I have some of that data too, if people are interested. Um, but uh, I think we get so many calls that um, we pretty much take more calls than 26 states combined. Um, so building the capacity of our crisis call centers is really critical. Um, and we still are getting twice the amount of calls for similar size states that are large, like New York and Texas. So we're getting a lot of volume into our 988 crisis care capacity or crisis centers. Um, so the other piece, and so we've got around 2% of, of emergency uh, rescues needed, but the part that's a lot more interesting is the 3.5% th uh, that are going to, uh, or getting routed to a mobile crisis outreach referral. Um, and this has seen some real improvement. In November of last year, this was this was 2.4. Um, in January, it was 4.4. The average is down to, to 3.5, but you can see the pretty significant improvement on a monthly basis of, of the work that the, that the centers and counties are doing to make sure that people who do need a mobile crisis response that is a behavioral health centered response is improving for Californians. So just wanted to share a little bit of the, the, the positive work that our centers are doing around the state um, and our counties are doing as they build out their mobile crisis teams. Um, and I don't think I have any other exciting things to share um, other than um, the reason why the RFP is so important to, to uh, us at Health and Human Services is that it represents our ability to really dive in uh, to the five-year implementation planning process. So very hopeful that that can actually kick off, probably not before our next meeting in August, but very shortly thereafter, um, we will start hosting those meetings and, and doing the outreach to find members for our policy advisory committee over the summer. So very excited to do that work. So thank you.
All right, thank you for the update. Any questions from the board for Stephanie? Any questions from board members online? All right, public comment online. Okay, go ahead, public comment. Uh, Sherry, go ahead. Question. Thank you, Budge. I have a question for Stephanie. I'm not sure if you can answer this or not. Um, but I know that recently SAMHSA has released um, another opportunity for funding for states and territories that California has participated in the in, in the past. I'm wondering with AB 988 funds coming available, will the state participate in that again? We're looking into that. I was doing it while I was also actively engaged in this meeting. Um, yeah, I, I did see that, Sherry. I don't have an answer for you, but it is something that we're reviewing. Thank Thanks. All right. Any other public comment on agenda item number seven? All right. Seeing, hearing none, we'll move on to agenda item number eight. Most of this um, I've already reported on. So um, again, I mentioned the proposed rule uh, making that they've got on reliable access to 988. You can reference the FCC proceedings on that. Um, we've actually been in conversations with Fibrin and, and their partner that they're working on that does their routing to um, establish a delivery point for 988 calls, chats, and texts in California. And uh, we continue to make sure that the cybersecurity requirements are addressed. This is a big part of of um, the considerations that we're doing. So those are some of the active work that we've been doing in this space uh, relative to SAMHSA and the FCC and Vibrant. I actually sent them a, an email yesterday. I'm waiting for a reply on as far as dates on meet points and trying to keep this project moving forward. So not sure if anyone from the board has any follow-up questions or things they want us to do relative to these topics that we haven't already talked about. It's looking for anybody. Go ahead, Erica. I think just a clarification, if the technology conversation with Vibrant is including all channels. It is. Yes. So do you mean all channels by calls, chats, and texts? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Um, we are including all of those in the conversation. Yeah, we'd like them all integrated in the same platform, one delivery mechanism so that you train once, migrate once, and, and you get uh, the ability to do what you need to support your workflow. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, any other questions from board or online that you're seeing on agenda item number eight? All right, a lot of this, like I said, I had already covered. So, all right, we're at the point now where we've got um, agenda items for future meetings. Our next meeting is August 17th. I will let you know that you're going to receive a cancellation message for that meeting. Do not freak out. We are transitioning from, team, from uh, Zoom to Teams. And if you've ever heard the audio taper that happens when people talk for a while, I'm hoping that will address that technical problem as well as some other limitations that we're seeing with the current platform. So um, you will get a new invite for both August and November, um, removing the Zoom meetings, adding the Teams meetings, and we're transitioning fully over to Teams. Um, I'm tracking one additional agenda item. That's the FCC letter discussion that we need to add to the ad agenda. Does anybody else have any um, any members of the board with agenda items for future meeting? You see any members online raise their hand? All right. So we will add that one agenda item and then we'd certainly look forward to seeing everybody or hearing everybody uh, in August at our next meeting. We'll now transition to public comment. And so this is an opportunity for board members to comment on anything that was not on the agenda that we didn't cover. So we'll open it up first to board members. Any comments we didn't talk about? Okay, members of the public, for any members that weren't, uh, any items that were not on the agenda? Give a nice awkward pause to let people think about that. This is Matt Taylor again from D.D. Hirsch. I just want to comment that the last link I provided in the chat would, I, in my opinion, be um, a good read for those that are drafting the letter to the FCC, specifically starting on page eight of the FCC report, because it clearly outlines some of the benefits of geolocation. And I think that such a letter would be um, would be enhanced by referencing that, as well as a recognition of some of the privacy 
uh, considerations that are noted there and California's um, view about, you know, the, 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 those considerations in, in balance or, or um, relative to the potential benefits and upsides. Thank you, Matt. I have read that. And I'm very familiar with page eight and following of that report. Oh, I was just going to say, I don't have the chat enabled. So can someone send that to us so we can, can educate ourselves? Yeah. Thank you. So Carrie, can you send that link out to uh, all the board members and just make sure they've got access to it? Um, these are FCC comments. So they're written in a certain way. Um, so um, have, yeah, have coffee. Um, <laughs> be be well caffeinated when you begin the reading. Um, they're written in a specific format, but once you dig into them, you can kind of see. And the way it works is the FCC will ask a series of questions. Responders respond to those questions. You have to dig through to see what everybody commented on. And then the FCC summarizes those in a report. And that's kind of what this document is. So it's a it's a process. Okay, thank you for that, Matt. Any other comments from the public? All right. So this might be everybody's favorite agenda uh, topic, adjournment. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Yes. From Stephanie, do we have a second? I second that. All right, thanks, Suzanne. All right, we stand adjourned. My time is 12.09. So we are adjourning the meeting and thank you everybody for your participation and uh, ongoing support of this. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone. You know.